But um, this is obviously uh, one for you to start with. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, uh, when I told a, f a friend and colleague what I was doing today, <coughs> he recounted a tale of going to a developing country that shall remain nameless with his family, and they were invited to ride uh, horses uh, that were in a terrible condition. And his daughter was appalled and said, Daddy, we've got to do something about this. We need a campaign, save horses in trouble. And then they realized what the acronym would be. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about saving horses in trouble, and I'm going to use acronyms, but not that one, you'll be pleased to know. But joking apart, this is a serious subject. There are well over 100 million equine uh, animals in the, in the world, and well over 80% of those are in developing countries. Um, I've worked a lot in Africa. What is interesting, actually, about much of Africa is that much of the areas of Africa are denied to horses by disease, sort of disease exclusion in, in the, in the sub-Sahel. But nearer in the northern, um, immediately sub-Sahel, in, in northern Nigeria, Cameroon, through to, to Sudan, Ethiopia, and in North Africa, in the Middle East, and, of course, in Central and South America, working equines are hugely important. And they preserve vital functions, collecting uh, fuel, uh, wood, which is of course the major fuel of many develop in de developing countries, water, uh, traction, uh, and hauling goods, and, and increasingly important in uh, tourism. And often, of course, they are owned by the poorest sector of the population, which presents uh, major problems. It's been said that a family may be five times better off if they own a, a working horse. And the problems they face, of course, are related to parasitism, disease, nutrition, uh, uh, and problems of access to veterinary services. Now, the question referred to veterinary education. Uh, surveys have shown um, that, um, that there is adequate cover within curricula on equine matters, but in many cases uh, the cover may be inappropriate. Uh, a lot of the teaching may be more directed to the problems we have in the developed world because, of course, we tend to write the textbooks and so on. It is a fallacy to think there aren't enough vets in the developed world. There are, are, are a lot of veterinary schools. I mean, there are well over 40 in Brazil, well over 40 in Mexico. The oldest veterinary school in the New World is actually in Mexico City. So there, there are vets, and there are vets uh, being produced, but it's important that we make their education appropriate. The problems with working horses as well, of course, are not just about ed education. It's a problem that is common to um, human uh, medicine uh, in the developing world, and that is a problem of delivery, a delivery of health care to, to rural communities in remote areas with, with poor infrastructure. And one of the important ways of addressing that, and I'm very pleased to see the way that the equine charities have been uh, confronting this, is to engage paraprofessionals as well at community level to ensure community delivery of health care. What more can be done? Well, I've been very impressed coming at this as something of an outsider to, to see the incredible work that the horse charities have been doing, many working internationally, like World Health Welfare, Sparna, Donkey Sanctuary, and others, many working nationally, like the Gambia Horse and Donkey Trust, uh, Animal Care in Egypt, ACE, another acronym. Um, and interestingly, a lot of those, uh, their activities are going beyond animal welfare per se, but into sustainable community development, recognizing uh, the core value of the working equine in those places. I was delighted to hear uh, Rowley in his earlier address refer to the importance of, of education uh, and research, because there is, uh, in, in when we seek to, to help uh, animals in need. Uh, there is a compounded benefit of directing investment into education and research. Now, you would expect me to say that as an academic, but for every few hundred uh, professionals and paraprofessionals we train, within their working life, they will benefit hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of individual animals. And the value of research may be compounded even further major uh, improvements in diagnosis, in treatment, in the management of disease can be rolled out globally and, and benefit millions. 
I'm gratified to see how much is being done. I, I would say keep up the good work uh, by the World Health uh, Welfare uh, and other charities. Uh, it is doing a lot of good and it is making a big impact. Thank you. Sandy, thank you. Mum, as part of your wonderful travelling with Save the Children, have you seen this uh, around the world? Um, yes, funnily enough, a classic example was um, um, delivery of vaccines in Somalia, which was basically a livestock-based um, um, society. And the only way we could get the vaccines to the mothers and the children was to get, would, to get the vets to take them because um, the families, the fathers, would use the family to move the stock, but he wouldn't let them go separately to the clinic. So if they were there when you were moving the stock, you took the vaccines with the vet. Um, and maybe it can work the other way around as well. Uh, it, it is, I think, the, one of the challenges for all the agencies in, the, in, in medical delivery, so to speak, is having the, the levels appropriate levels within the community that are not uh, fully trained by the doctors or vets, but as you say, are trained at levels where they can, like farriers at the, at the lowest, at the village level, that then can refer up the line that are relatively simple and can build in a continuing program of education based on that initial training. And that applies to um, the, health workers, but there's no reason really why that shouldn't be a, a joint um, program because it's at a level which is more about observation, spotting trouble and the ability to, to bring in a bit of help than it is about anything cleverer. And many of them have local knowledge and local coping mechanisms. Sometimes they're very good, sometimes they're completely off the beam, but have probably been brought in by somebody else uh, at a previous period. So there's a lot of knowledge there to work from, and people, normally you'll find somebody in a village who is fundamentally interested in doing what you want to do, but at a level which is appropriate.